Hello viewers, welcome to MOOC's online course on Visual Perception and Art, a survey across the cultures. This is the first lecture, that is an introductory lecture of the first week of this course. And in this lecture, we shall be introducing ourselves to the idea of visual perception and also to the idea how visual perception is integrally connected to art. So, it is mandatory for us to have a reasonably um, good idea about what visual perception is all about and how it generally affects and influences the way we not only perceive the world visually, but also the way we receive artworks and the way we connect ourselves with the art language. It is needless to say that visual perception is actually a very complex phenomenon. And really speaking, if you look at the idea of visual perception, not just as a phenomenon, but also as an experience, you will realize that visual perception is not merely a visual ability, but it is more than that. It is not merely a biological phenomenon, but it is something beyond that. It is about our ability and habit to interpret what we see. And this is extremely important that visual perception is not about a passive reception of the visual signals, but it is about our ability to interpret what we are receiving. So, it is also about dealing with the challenge between what we see and what we know, since there can often be a conflict between the two. Simple everyday experiences are full of such conflicts between visual perception and knowledge. One of the commonest such examples is the daily occurrence like a sunrise or a sunset. In both these cases, what we observe is absolutely different from and opposite to what we know. Hence, as John Berger says, the relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. This unsettling and rather conflicting relationship between what we see and what we know is extremely important for our understanding of how art operates or art functions in the realm of visual perception. Now, following John Berger, we can say that each evening 
we see the sun set, yet we know that the earth is turning away from it. Yet the knowledge, the explanation never quite fits the sight. So, this is very interesting, this is about that conflict. For example, when you look at this photograph of a table, a small table, you know very well that all the four legs of this table are of equal height. Yet, in this photograph and also in reality, we often find that the legs of the chair, which are further away from us, happen to appear, they happen to appear smaller than the legs which are closer to us. Again, it is a visual perception which is in conflict with our knowledge that all the four legs of the chair are equal in height. Similarly, when you look at a four wheelers from a particular angle, what you see is simply a pair of wheels, just one single pair of wheels, whereas any four wheelers would certainly have not two, but four wheels. And they are obviously behind these two wheels that we are able to see. Now, our knowledge says that this particular vehicle contains four wheels, but our visual knowledge right now gives a different information altogether. According to that data, at this particular moment, from this particular angle, this motor car or this vehicle has only two wheels. Another example, a very, very common example is the way we often find the two parallel lines are tending to, are almost about to meet each other at a particular point, though they are parallel. Now, this is what we see when we look at the railway track, when we look at a road, when we look at such two parallel lines running parallel to each other and they are almost as if they appear to meet each other at a particular point, yet we know very well that they never meet in real life. So, again we are looking at a conflict between the visual perception and visual knowledge. When we look at the railway track, when we look at a road, when we look at such two parallel lines running parallel to each other and they are almost as if they appear to meet each other at a particular point, yet we know very well that they never meet in real life. So, again we are looking at a conflict between the visual perception and visual knowledge. Now, in visual arts too, do you think artists always painted exactly the way they saw things around? More often than not, they followed a very, very different kind of method to portray or represent the reality. The way figures and space appear in Egyptian paintings, for example, is not exactly how they actually appeared in real life. Does visual perception play a slightly different role in the context of art? Now, these are some of the questions, very vexed questions we will be trying to explore in this course in the subsequent lectures. Now, this is one example of an Egyptian painting. The frontality of the body of the figure, the profile character of the face, the profile positioning of the hands that is the arms as well as the legs look like as if it is a constructed reality, it is not exactly the way 
obviously people egyptian people during the egyptian period moved all the time this is certainly not what the artists actually saw but this is the way he painted or communicated that visual knowledge through a certain kind of visual language so when we come to this idea of visual language we see there is a very definitive not exactly a conflict or a contrast but a difference between the visual language and visual perception which in fact implies that in order to perceive art visually in a proper way we need to actually bring the visual perception of reality into some crisis i mean we should not always try to follow the logic of visual perception in our daily life and apply that straight forward to understand the logic of the visual language though they are often feed on each other they are integral to each other in more than one way so when you look at a worldly painting a folk indian painting painted on the rural walls of indian villages like this obviously the communication mode or the pictorial style here is an independent innovation yet the visual perception has certainly played an indirect role in influencing the style when we have a separate lecture on indian folk folk art in the next week we shall discuss in detail how exactly the visual perception of real life is actually influencing the visual language of a folk art like this or for that matter when you look at a very very prehistoric painting like bhimbetka rock painting in madhya pradesh of india painted 10000 or 12000 years back again when you look at these figures it is impossible to believe that the human figures of that period were all stick like they were all in silhouettes they were all figures without any uh, details no facial features obviously this is not the way they uh, lived they definitely had a more tangible and a more detailed expressions of life which of course these painters are not representing hence the perceived reality visually perceived reality and the visually constructed reality in a painting may not be exactly the same so we have plenty of such painters in the folk art uh, and also you find similar kind of visualization by children you find similar kind of visualizations by naive artists who tend to construct a visual real visual reality on paper or on canvas with paint or in paint and pencil in a way that is certainly derived out of their visual perception of the reality but when they construct a visual reality on paper it becomes a different visual perception now this takes us to a, a wonderful understanding and a very interesting understanding and a very intriguing kind of idea that whether we have only one kind of visual perception that is a normal general visual perception we usually talk about or we have several different kinds of visual perceptions depending on the artwork that we are looking at so when we are looking at a child art like this we need to talk about visual perception from a completely different perspective like this one the way they will when we look at a child art like this we usually we tend to say that this is how the child looks at figures now this is again a problematic assumption is this the way they actually look at figures in the real life or this is the way they paint or draw the figures on their paper so they create a different kind of visual perception different from what they perceive in real life and everybody does that in some way or the other 
in the context of visual perception as a fundamental aspect of experience and evolution, John Bircher further says, seeing comes before words. The child looks and recognizes before it can speak. John Berger further adds, but there is also another sense in which seeing comes before words. It is seeing which establishes our place in the surrounding world. We explain that world with words, but words can never undo the fact that we are surrounded by it. In other words, words, spoken language or written language can never replace our visual experiences or the experience of seeing and looking. In other words, visual perception happens to remain a constant feature no matter what, no matter what different kinds of modes of communications we may incorporate in order to convey our feelings, our messages to the world. It can be a writing a novel, writing a poetry, it can be a music, it can be a song, but the presence of the visual perception is always there. This is what John Berger is trying to say. The way we see things is affected by what we know or what we believe. In the middle ages when men believed in the physical existence of hell, the sight of fire must have meant something different from what it means today. Nevertheless, their idea of hell owed a lot to the sight of fire consuming and the ashes remaining as well as to their experience of the pain of burns. Now, when John Burgess says something like this, it clearly indicates that he is trying to suggest that visual perception is integrally connected with visual experiences, of course, but more than that cultural experiences, mythical experiences, our belief systems, our tradition, our customs, our habits. And this is again another very, very important aspect that we shall be exploring in our subsequent lectures that how visual perception tends to go beyond a mere biological or habitual experience and becomes a major cultural practice, an expression of a culture. And this is how when a medieval painter in a painting conceives hell with fire as a major element, this way of conceiving or imagining hell has something to do with the way they experienced fire in real life. And therefore, when they look back at the fire after having painted or seen this painting, then the fire assumes different sets of mythological meanings which it did not have before. So, in other words, the cultural significance of our visual perception is so important that not only it influences the art we produce, but it also influences the way we see the general reality around. One such visual uh, expression or representation of hell where fire is used in a very innovative way. Another painting, this is a Japanese painting where you can see fire once again been used to represent the, 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 the sign, the character of hell. But interestingly, in each of these paintings, the fire has been painted in a slightly different way, though the general context remains more or less the same. Yet this scene which comes before words and can never be quite covered by them is not a question of mechanically reacting to stimuli. It can only be thought of in this way if one isolates the small part of the process which concerns the eye's retina. 
we only see what we look at. This is again another very interesting observation, because to look is an act of choice. As a result of this act, what we see is brought within our reach, though not necessarily within arm's reach. To touch something is to situate oneself in relation to it. Close your eyes. This is what John Bircher is suggesting as an experiment. Close your eyes, move round the room and notice how the faculty of touch is like a static limited form of sight. When you close your eyes or you are blindfolded and you are asked to walk in your room, a room that you know so well, yet you try to figure out where you are walking, what you are touching through the faculty of touch, through a tactile sensation. And it is then that you realize that this tactile communication is a very, very limited version of visual communication. We never look at just one thing. We are always looking at one in relation between things and ourselves. Our vision is continually active. After all, we are not looking at one thing, but we are looking at the relation between things and ourselves. And being an active, being engaged in a continuously active vision, which is continuously moving, continuously holding things in a circle around itself and constituting what is present to us as we are. So, this is again a very interesting experience that we all pass through almost every day. The act of choice on the one hand and the cultural, natural environment of the time on the other make visual perception itself a bit complex. And further, the relationship between the visual perception and the visual art forms more intriguing. That is why in highly sophisticated art forms like Ajanta paintings or Rajput miniature paintings, the pictorial styles often look quite fabricated. They look over stylized. Although these art forms are the product of a certain visual culture, which was very powerful and influential at that point of time. In that sense, these art forms are not devoid of the impact of the normal visual perceptions of the society. This is again another aspect that we shall try to explore in some of our subsequent le lectures, where we shall see that how visual perception and the given society also have a relationship to establish, a relationship to explore. This is a painting from Ajanta, which is seemingly very over stylized. Even the figuration looks fabricated, artificial, but they are all derived from a certain visual perception of the reality. For that matter, this particular miniature painting from Ragamala, the Rajput miniature painting, where you see nature, female character, birds, a snake, water, tiger, everything in a, in a quite convincing way as far as the sign of each and every object is concerned. Yet, they do not look realistic or natural the way a western painting is supposed to look, but it is also quite uh, interesting to think that this kind of visual forms have a deep connection with the visual perception this culture has been taught to experience. A highly realistic painting on the other hand appears to have resolved the complicated problem of relating art form with the visual perception. Seemingly, the visual form in a realistic art is a convincing reflection of the immediate visual perception, but in reality it is not. Yes, certainly realistic pictorial style does have apparently a close relationship with the real visual perception. Yet, here too it is not devoid of the cultural perception. 
it is not devoid of the traditional norms and habits and of course, your choice of what you want to depict and with what kind of objective. And we shall explore this aspect as well in one of our later lectures where we shall see that even a very convincing highly realistic painting will also have a particular way of constructing the visual reality different from the normal visual perception. It is not as realistic as it appears to be. This is one such example of a highly realistic painting from Baroque period. Another example of a realistic painting which is so real, which is so natural that you feel that you can almost touch the objects, you can almost smell the objects. But in order to evoke these feelings, the realism involved in this painting has a certain visual language to construct. And finally, photography. Photography happens to be again another highly convincing medium of representing the reality. Look at any photograph, either taken candidly or taken rather seriously, you will find that usually a photograph looks less fabricated, less artificial than any hand painted painting. But every image embodies a way of seeing, even a photograph embodies a way of seeing. It is not infallible in the sense there is no reason why you should take a photograph for granted, but you have as it were every right to challenge a painting, because for photographs are not as is often assumed a mechanical record. Every time we look at a photograph, we are aware however slightly of the photographer selecting that side from an infinitely or infinity of other possible sites. The photographer's way of seeing is reflected in his choice of subject. This is what John Berger says and as an extension we can say that it is not just photograph, any kind of visual perception, visual reception, visual experience has a choice involved in it. It may not always be a very conscious choice. Often, it is, a, it is not so conspicuous that we are making a choice. It is not so obvious that we are making a choice. But there is a choice, there is a selection involved. What you will be looking at will depend on what you want to look at. And human intervention at this point is extremely important to discuss visual perception and art particularly the relationship, the very complex relationship that exists between them. Thank you.